You're on with Lauren Zayu for Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered, a show about what you say, how you say it, and what to do after it's said. We'll talk about communications and messaging blunders, successes, distractions, and what all of it means for you. Join me for a crash course in what you need to know in politics and issues driving the 2020 elections. Hello and welcome to Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered. I'm your host, Lauren Zayu. This conversation is happening on November 8th, 2020, one day after the historic election of the first woman to be Vice President of the United States, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. Since 2018, there have been Black women elected up and down the ballot in various positions, and none more memorable than Harris County, Texas, electing 17 Black women as judges in one election. We have here to discuss some of the politics around Black women running for office and being elected. One of those women, Judge Deidre Davis of the 270th District Court, she was elected judge on November 6, 2018. Judge Davis received her bachelor's degree from Texas Tech University and her JD from South Texas College of Law. Judge Davis is a member of the Texas Bar College, the American Bar Association, the Houston Bar Association, Association of Women Attorneys, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, NAACP, ACLU, and numerous other groups and organizations. Judge Davis is the recipient of many awards, including being formerly named Legal Executive of the Year, receiving a Deidre Davis Day from Houston Mayor, and a proclamation from Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. I'm excited to have on Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered, Judge Deidre Davis. Hello, Judge Davis. Hello, 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 uh, Lauren, and hello to the Unboss audience. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad to have you. How are you today? Doing terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Very excited. Um, we can breathe. Yeah. We can breathe is a great, a great way to frame that. Yes. Um, for, for the purpose of this conversation, just to, to kind of kick it off, when you ran for office in 2018, was that your first time running? Yes, that was my first time running. I was not in politics at all. I was an entertainment attorney. Uh, my slogan was, um, one of them, music is my life. Let this music lawyer handle your music law business. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. Uh, I did uh, transactional and litigation for um, the entertainment industry and that's a lot of corporate law. That's a lot of intellectual property with copyright trademarks. I don't know if you remember the big lawsuit. One of the biggest that I did that was worth many, many millions. I sued Dr. Dre. I sued um, uh, Universal. And it was regarding one of my clients uh, in India. And it was over the uh, song Truth Hurts. So yeah. uh, Dr. Dre, they did a sample, but they didn't ask permission. All they had to do was ask permission. But, you know, it was way in India. They didn't know if anybody cared. But my client ended up being one of the largest film and music uh, companies in India. And they did care. Oh, wow. Yeah, un understandably so. Um, so what do you feel like, uh, one, made you run for judge, like made you take that leap? And then what did you learn as you were doing that? Absolutely. So uh, we'll break it into two parts. The first part I'll answer is why did I uh, take that leap and then ask me the second part and I'll answer that as well. Why did I take that leap? I was simply sick and tired of being sick and tired. Hmm. 2016, when January 1st of 2017 came, every single day when we woke up, there were more tweets, there was more hatred, there was negative after negative after negative, and it was just frustrating. I would be upset, I would be crying, because although uh, the politics didn't necessarily at that time affect me directly, I actually do care about other people. I do care about you putting bans on Muslims. I do care about you sticking babies in cages. Mm -hmm. I do care about you now giving women hysterectomies th that you've put in cages that didn't want the hysterectomies. Mm -hmm. All of this, this hatred, this divisiveness, continuously putting us against one another 
and and making the environment just nothing but hatred. And so I was just very upset and very frustrated. So I started getting phone calls around March,ish maybe April, from judges and other lawyers saying, "Hey, the Democratic Party they need qualified, experienced." Uh, people with integrity that are going to do a really good job on the bench. And my response was, well, you know, I hope they find them because <laughs> I'm having a really good time over here in the entertainment world and traveling all over the world. And mm -hmm. I loved what I was doing. Absolutely loved what I was doing. But as I continue to be harassed, I started thinking about when I was in the booth for 2016, and I remember a few years in the past, there were slots that did not have any Democrats. Mm. It would only be a Republican. And I used to wonder, why isn't anybody running? Why isn't there a Democrat running? We need a change. Why isn't anyone running? And so as they continue to um, talk to me, I figured out that if you want to change, you need to be the change. So I decided I needed to review, I hadn't committed yet, review stepping up and being the change. Mm. Now, how being a judge was um, a good avenue because I did not want to delve into the political world, not really realizing how political when you're running for judges. Mm. I didn't want to, you know, so I don't want to be city council or state rep or anything. I didn't at that time but um and then going in and out of court there were a number of things that i did not like about how the court system was running mm -hmm. i'm a civil judge i was doing civil law and uh, but there were still a lot of issues uh one that i remember uh, very much is when i was in federal court and the federal judge uh, when he was talking to uh, me and the opposing counsel, opposing counsel, he'd say, counselor, counselor, counselor. And with me, he'd say, young lady, young lady, young lady. And I'm thinking, well, I'm counselor too, <laughs> you know? And so I, I try to make it a point to make sure if I say counselor, every you're both counselor because you all have to go through the same thing. And when you look at the walls, and I don't know if you've been seeing that picture of the previous uh, vice presidents, and they all look the same. Well, the judiciary is similar to that. It is changing. Dallas, it changed a lot quicker, but it, it and it's slowly changing. But when you look at the walls and of who the people were making the decisions, they did not look like you and they did not look like me. They did not have the gender. They did not have the race nor the ethnicity. I'm in Houston, Harris County. It's a very diverse area. So you need diversity because a plethora of people are coming with all type backgrounds, not just one type person. The other thing is, even though I add something with the background and diversity adds something with the background, we are able to make decisions for everybody. So why did I run? There needed to be a change. I decided I need to step up and become the change. So I tell people, hello, my name is Deidre Davis. Just call me the change. I love that, just call me the change. Okay, and my second question that I'd asked was what you felt like you learned um, as you were running. There were a number of things that I learned uh, as I was running. I learned there was a lot more hopelessness then I realized I knew that people were hopeless. I knew that people were frustrated. You know, we all were. But once you go out and start talking to people outside of your circle, you go to areas that you never would have gone before because it's just not part of your world. You find that the people just feel discouraged. And that's one reason in Harris County, which is where I am, Houston is based in Harris County. That's one reason you have over 5 million people that live here 
and only 2.4 million are registered to vote. That's less than half of the people that live here are even registered. Now that registered number is a more recent number since we've had our more recent county clerk, Christopher Hollins, who is spectacular. He's like Superman. Our more recent uh, tax assessor who also deals with registering people and Bennett, they've upped the number of people who have registered to vote by many, many, many thousands, hundred thousands. But think about that. Right now, today, over 5 million, but only 2,500,000 are registered. That's a problem. But when you're talking to them, you find, and this is one thing that someone said to me, because I, I say, I understand when, when I ran in 2018, that's called midterm. So it's not a presidential year. A lot of people don't realize, yes, you absolutely need to vote the presidential year. But that next two years is when you vote for the governor. It's called midterms. And it's also when you vote for a lot of the judges. And we had over 70 judges, 7-0, over 70 positions on the ballot. Well, it's impossible to know all 70 plus of those people. So my position was vote party because you can see very clearly what um, the parties believe. You can see very clearly what the Republican Party believes as a whole, what the Democratic Party believes at a, as a whole. Now, you have individuals, we have our own minds, but you're looking at ideals and ideologies. So when you're going down, you want to hit each one of those tallies with that's lined up with, with the way that you think. So no, you might not know Deidre Davis, you haven't had a chance to research Deidre Davis, but if you believe in some of the ideals that the Democrats believe, you don't have to believe every single thing. Who does believe every single thing? But the general ideals, then you're like, okay, well, let me vote for Deidre Davis. And then let's see the changes. And I'm here to tell you, I personally have made drastic changes uh, here on my bench drastic changes. And a lot of them are sur surrounded around the experiences that I had and experiences that I didn't, but I just heard about and talked to people. I had a gentleman tell me when I was on the campaign trail, I hauled the big chest with ice and drinks and I took a bunch of the drinks or soft drinks and water. And I took, <laughs> I took a bunch of chips and stuff and I went out to um, here we have a place called Third Ward. And I t went to a basketball court and hauled it all out. And I'm like, y'all want some water, some chips or whatever. And then I start talking to them and trying to tell them, oh, you need to go vote. But I learned several things from these, these uh, gentlemen that were on the court playing basketball because they definitely wanted some water and ice cold water. And they were hungry. They wanted some chips, you know, just to knock the edge off. So one gentleman said, well, you know, I hear you. Why would I even bother? Because I have one white man Republican running for judge and I have another white man Republican running for Democrat. What is that doing for me? And I said, well, sir, I'm not white and I'm not a man and I'm running. So it's a new day there's more diversity and there's there's opportunities for your voice to be heard so you can come and vote for me you can come and vote for the slate just just take a look and see that it's not all just one thing it's nothing wrong with voting for the white man he might be perfect but that's not all 70 seats there are other people who are who are qualified other people who are perfect. When I went for the bench, I had over 30 years of legal experience. The person that I beat who had been in this seat for 20 years, when he ran, he had about 15-ish years of experience. So I almost doubled the amount that the white he was a white man that the white man had. So there are other people who are experienced. Just if they have an opportunity and an opportunity to run. So that was that was 
very profound that he's like, okay, you're yelling, run, vote Democrat is the same. And my message was, well, there are, are some differences. The other thing that I found um, very telling is I met a man who, on that basketball court, who actually was had a, fel a felony. And I don't like to call them felons because you're human. You just happen to have a felony against you. So he wasn't a felon in my eyes. He was a gentleman who had a felony against him. And so, and that's what I explained to him when he told me he was a felon. I'm like, you're not defined by that title. You made a mistake. You've paid your debt. You're still on paper, so you can't vote, but you're not a felon. You're a human being like the rest of us that just, you know, made a mistake. So, but what I did tell him he could do because he was telling me, oh, well, you know, the judges, I hate this judge, whatever. He was saying all these things that happened. And come to find out, the judge that he had was one that had been on television and everywhere talking about um, black men making racist statements against black men and making race, racist statements against black people were literally... He, he had no shame. He had been in that seat for years. When it's midterm, people don't really know, you know, a lot of people don't know the vote. A lot of people of color weren't really voting. And he knew he was going to stay. So he didn't care. He didn't care that he said things about people that he knew didn't even know he was elected. So I told the gentleman, I'm like, okay, I understand that you're on paper and you cannot go vote, but you can go canvas and go talk to people and let people know you can't cast that one vote, but you can go help rally hundreds or thousands of votes. You can do it online. You can do it door to door. You can do it on this basketball court. And I told him, do you know that man that you're talking about has been harassing you for the past 12-ish years? Do you know he's up for re-election? You can have him voted out of office? Go tell some of your friends about this man. He has to be elected. And he didn't know the man was elected. And I'm happy to say that man got knocked out of office when I came in in 2018. He was not, he, I didn't run against him. He's a criminal judge, but he did get voted out of office. So that's a telling example of how you, your voice, your vote, it gives you power and it gives you a lot of power. Yeah, it does. And I think you've hit on so many great points um, about the importance of judges, about the importance of the electoral process. I did um, kind of, interestingly enough, we know that Vice President-elect Harris also has a uh, legal background. She was a prosecutor and then was attorney general. And there's been a lot of conversation around um, her record and how that goes. Um, and so I, and there's been like, excitement about that and people who, who offer other critique. But I kind of wanted to, to talk about how you feel like your experiences as a black woman have helped you on the bench and like ways that you think it's, uh, ways that like that can, that's important, the, acknowledging that that's an important space for black people to occupy. So again, break my questions up for me. The yes, first one I'll answer, how am I in that space? And then you bring me that next question. So I will do that. it's been wonderful. There are things that I expected, the differences that, I, that I'm able to make. And there are things that I did not expect. Some of the things that I did not expect is all of a sudden, law firms have been pulling out the woodwork, every woman they can find and every woman of color that they can find. I'm actually a state judge and we deal with uh, potentially millions and millions of dollars. And um, so that's often a space that's white male. Uh, the, the lawyers, you'll have lawyers that are 600 an hour, 1500 an hour. 1200 an hour because they're dealing with multi-million dollar folks. Well, a lot of women don't have an opportunity to come into that space. Uh, a lot of people of color absolutely don't have an opportunity to come in that space. When you look at the roster for a lot of the huge firms, you might find one person of color, 
maybe one person who's black. Um, if you're lucky, maybe the firm is a little more diverse, but it, it people don't realize how uh, segregated the legal community is. And so now, because I'm sitting there and because they think I'm very shallow, they don't know me. They just think, oh, she sees a woman. She might rule in our favor. She sees somebody black. She might rule in our favor. Um, they're even finding like a law clerk and they'll say, oh, this is our law student, you know, whatever, it, because they had to round them up. But what I decided is I was going to embrace that experience and enjoy that experience because I could be offended that you think that I'm that shallow, that because you brought a woman in or because you brought a person of color in, I'm a rule in your favor. But I, I choose not to look at it like that. The way I look at it is now a woman has had an opportunity to come in this court in a meaningful way. Now a woman has had an opportunity to hear some of the things that these $1,500 an hour men are saying when they're in court. Now a person of color has had an opportunity and I have personally made it my business to try and put more women and more people of color into this courtroom system with a number of different programs. As I've been on the bench since January 2018, I had over a thousand students that's fifth grade on up come into the courtroom. They were able to sit on the courtroom bench. I let them hold the gavel. They took pictures. I have a leadership program where I was giving certificates out and just letting them see themselves. People don't realize how important it is to see yourself, to believe that you can do it. And another meme that I love that came out yesterday about Kamala Harris Vice President elect Kamala Harris was one where she was walking and a little girl shadow was walking. That is very, very telling that that's reality. You need to be able to see yourself. And we think that people can see themselves, but they can't. So it's important for us. I'm a public servant. I think that public servants should actually serve the public. And so it was important for me to have the students in. I paid for many buses of 50 students to bring them in. Most of them were um, Black and Hispanic, or at least the schools were, and peppered with whoever else, because I didn't say only Black or Hispanic, just these schools. And some of them wrote me letters. They had never been on elevators before. The only time a lot of children even been to a courthouse or heard of a courthouse is when their mom or dad is being dragged off to prison. So I'm my goal is to let you know that the entire court system doesn't isn't bad. I'm civil. I'm dealing with money. When you have conflicts with people over your contracts or um, something dealing with money, you don't have to sit in the street and fight it out. Come over to court and I'll help you resolve it. We'll help you get it resolved. More I've done dealing with expunctions. So there's a number of things that um, I feel I've made a monumental impact. I'm continuing to do so, and I have even more that I want to do. So when I run next time, we'll just continue and, and hopefully make a huge difference in Harris County and a huge difference nationwide, worldwide, because people are able to see that they can do it too. Your second part? Okay, my second part of the question was about how, I mean, you you answered a great deal of it, but about how important it is to have Black people in, in these particular roles. And that um, a lot of times when people are having a conversation about running for office, it's about the big ones, right? The governor, the president, the senator. But these are important positions that impact our local communities and people's lives day to day. Um, and so I just wanted to... I guess my one question is uh, how how you think experiences as a black person directly contribute uh, to the way that you do. run your court. And um, because you can't 
you can't deny who you are. So I bring a level of compassion to the court because someone when I was running said, and it was a white woman, well, what difference does it make if it's a man or if it's you? You're saying we need diversity. We need you. The law is the law. And I was like, yes, ma'am, the law is the law. But as the judge, you have opportunities to um, make concessions. And let me tell you what I mean. I'm able to tell you to go to mediation. The law is the law, but I can tell you, you need to talk about some of these things. I can tell you, um, you need to look at this this way or look at it that way. I can tell you in terms of the expunctions. The expunctions are you were arrested. One situation is you weren't convicted. The case was dismissed. Another situation is you were convicted, but you end up getting pardoned. Well, when people get arrested and the case is dismissed, they don't realize it's still on their record. You need the expunction to clear your record. So what I did is uh, the clerk, when I first got here that worked for this court, that it worked for the gentleman who had been here 20 years, she was like, oh, he hated expunctions. And, you know, he didn't, why did he even, he didn't even want to bother with them, et cetera. So I had them go back and my coordinator now to go back to 2008. And we looked for every open expunction that existed. We, and now every week, we make sure that the lawyers and the people, a lot of pro se, are keeping up with them. And we were able to close out because a lot of people thought that their cases were finished. Some of the lawyers had died and, and the people didn't know. They thought their matters were finished and closed, but they still had that information on their record. When you go for a job and they do a detailed search, it shows up. When you go and for housing, it's showing up. When you're applying for college and wondering why whatever college didn't accept you, that arrest is showing up. So you need that information not to show. I care about that because everyone in my world is not a person who has zero arrest, zero um, uh, negative experiences. I have a world of many people <laughs> with many experiences, people in prison right now, people who've been to prison, people who haven't been to prison. Yes, I hung with the eagles and sword, but I do know some buzzards. I mean, you know, we, we do in the neighborhood or, or not even if it's your neighborhood. When I was growing up, my grandmother used to say, this is in Dallas. She used to say, when y'all go to the park, don't go that other direction because the other direction is where the projects are. Don't you dare go there, go this direction. What did we do? We made a beeline to the projects. <laughs> <laughs> be lie to the projects. And, but you learned a lot, you know, humans are humans. And of course your family wants you to do that, but I learned a lot and I learned what I didn't want. I learned about different people and, and, you know, there you go. So there's um, a lot of dimensions. It's not just white and black. There's a lot of gray and having diversity there brings a plethora of experiences different ideas. I know I was the only court before the uh, pandemic, the only court um, in Harris County, a uh, civil district, there's 24 of us, that allowed you to do uh, virtual video uh, show up at my, at my hearings or show up uh, at trial virtually. No other court allowed that, but I did. It was through a system court call. And then it just so happened we have the pandemic and now that's what all we have to do, right? But I was already doing that. So thinking outside the box, being cutting edge, those are things that I have prided myself in, in doing and in bringing to this court and bringing to the bench. I um, press upon my staff that we are here to provide world-class customer service. Um, that we're here, the lawyers and litigants are basically our customers because if they don't come to the court, we don't have a job. We're, we're 
you know, I'm a judge. If you don't need me to ever judge anything, you know, I don't have a job. So uh, I work very hard to make sure that they're polite. And that's an issue in this building. I mean, you'll find out that often because people know you are needed, they know that they have to come to court, especially criminal, you know, they have to come to whatever. Everybody's not nice to them. But what I'm bringing is you need to be nice and we need to offer people customer service and we need to listen. I've had people tell me I've been to so many different courts. I had one guy that went to the court of appeals twice on an issue. And he said, you are the only judge that's ever, that's ever listened to me when I was on this level with my, who was my predecessor. And then when he went to the court of appeals twice, it was a different, pretty much different court of appeals than it is now because part of that 70 are the Democrats that that are up there now. But he's he had gone before and he said no one listened. It's because you're and he was a black man and because you're human and I view you as a another human. I don't view you as um, anything in a negative light. I view you in a positive light and I make an effort to give you the utmost um, respect. So those are things that diversity brings. Those are things that different genders bring because sometimes you need compassion. I agree. Compassion is always needed. Um, and in a, if you could go back 10 years and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? 10 years, one piece of advice is, um, now I do have to say, I am from a family that continuously told me I could do anything that I wanted to do. So I didn't have those kind of issues. I was from a family that said, dream the impossible dreams, but really no dream is impossible. Uh, the only thing you need to do is decide what you want to do, make a plan, focus and execute that plan. So I don't have those kind of issues. I never had those kind of issues. But um, what I would tell myself, um, I think, is um, I guess continue, continue trusting and believing and praying. Those are things that I was already doing. And, um, but I think just continue that what your parents told you, what the nuns told you, what the priests told you, everything, your whole foundation, it really is, it really was true. And, um, I've seen that it's true through the years. But sometimes when you think, well, you know, is this, is this, you know, maybe I could do it a different way. Well, no, it, it really is true. If you stay consistent, if you um, move forward with integrity and character, um, you, it really does work. You know, it does. It really does work. So, uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I'm only 22, but um, I think that's the message. Um, but as I said, I'm not a person who really had a lot of issues like that because I had a support, uh, fam a supporting family and, and friends that always said, you're the best, you're the greatest, you're going to do magnificent. And the only issues... Um, I've ever had is just stopping to do and execute um, the things. Because sometimes you get sidetracked. But even being sidetracked is not the end of the world because um, I'm from a family where a couple of people did get sidetracked and um, got back on track and then everything was great. That is so powerful. Um, and thank you for sharing that with us. That like continuing and, and consistency is key. Judge Davis, I have enjoyed you so much. I really appreciate your coming on. Uh, and in the event that our listeners want to reach out to you or find you, what's the best way they do that? So I have several social media platforms. I have my Facebook. There's a couple. 
One is Deidre Davis ESQ. The other one is Judge Deidre Davis. So Judge Deidre Davis is good. Then I have Instagram, which is uh, Judge Deidre Davis. And my old Instagram is Music LW, because remember, Music Lawyer without the A. So Music LW. But Judge Deidre Davis will get you there. And then I have LinkedIn, which, of course, is Deidre Davis ESQ, but also Judge Deidre Davis. Uh, but I do more on the Deidre Davis ESQ. But you never lose with Judge Deidre Davis. <laughs> and then I have Twitter. Uh, mm -hmm. Twitter is uh, the Music LW, but it's also Deidre Davis wins. And this is very important that no matter what you do, winners win. So someone told me when I got on the campaign trail, you know, some woman, oh, you're always saying Deidre Davis wins. That sounds so arrogant. You shouldn't say that. You need to be more humble. And I said, well, why would you want a political candidate or a candidate who enters a race who thinks they're going to lose? Yeah. You you need to feel that you're going to win. I, and let me explain to you, negative person who's standing over here talking to me, regardless, I'm going to win. Because whether this race came out the way I wanted it or not, I won through the host of people that I met. I won through the host of information that I learned. My conversation here with you today, you hear how much I learned on the campaign trail, mm -hmm. how many variety of people I never would have met that I had an opportunity to speak. I went from just having the experience, the growing many days I cried on the campaign trail because everyone wasn't nice, but it helped me grow. And it also allowed me to see um, some of the dark side of some people, but some of the light in other people. That's growth. That's me mm -hmm. winning. So mm -hmm. anytime I'm learning, anytime I'm growing, anytime I'm having an opportunity to talk to someone, connect with some, meet someone, I win. So Deidre Davis wins. And so do you. <laughs> Amen. Um, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up here really quickly, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, you're listening to Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered. I'm your host, Lauren Zayu. In the event you want to hear more from me, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Lauren Zayu. You can also follow and subscribe to our podcast on Apple, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, you can also watch us on YouTube. And thank you for joining us on this journey. Thank you for tuning in to Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered with host Lauren Zayu and music by Lighthouse Productions. For more information on Unbossed, Unbothered, and Unfiltered, or to review today's episode, please follow at Lauren Zayu on Twitter and Instagram, or subscribe to the Lauren Zayu YouTube channel.